Hello everyone. I think many of you remember this video where I reviewed packages from subscribers. There, I showed these beauties. These are TK152-100 power transistors. Now it's 152-100. Very unusual and incredibly powerful. They were manufactured in the USSR in 1985. The parameters are quite fantastic. Even today, a bipolar NPN structure transistor. The maximum allowable continuous collector current is 63A. Pulse current is as high as 100A. The collector emitter voltage depends on the transistor class, MU, or the index. The most important thing is the power dissipated by the collector, 350W, and considering the form factor, it seems accurate. These transistors can be considered collectible, as they are rare and, naturally, no longer produced. It's very difficult to find modern equivalents with similar characteristics. Using a museum exhibit. In some project, it's a sin. But not using them when it comes to such transistors is not just a sin, but an unforgivable sin. I really wanted to understand what these transistors are capable of. And, to be honest, I was not just surprised, but amazed by their capabilities. Power transistors can have 100 to 500 applications. You probably thought I would make some kind of power supply or electronic load based on them. And you are right. Such powerful things belong in an electronic load. To be fair, I have already made an electronic load. In the fourth episode of Stealing from the Chinese, but that load was on modern field effect transistors. I think you'll be interested to see what these Soviet dinosaurs are capable of, so I started this project. The electronic load will operate in linear mode. This is the most demanding mode of operation for a transistor, and the size of its casing is important here, as the transistor will act as a heater, and all the power will simply go into heating the switch. And its casing must be able to transfer this heat to the heat sink. Here we have a perfectly suitable casing. Firstly, it's a good copper substrate with a decent area. Secondly, it has a threaded mount, which will greatly aid in heat dissipation. If the electronic load uses transistors in a 2220 package, the maximum load power will be no more than 80 watts, or 40 watts per transistor, if the transistors are in a 2247 package. The maximum power is 150 watts. When using a transistor in a 23 package, the maximum load power is 200 watts, which means 100 watts per transistor. I have already explained how a load of this type works in the episode Stealing from the Chinese 4. The link will be in the description. This load is essentially a current stabilizer. That is, you set the load current, for example, 1A, and regardless of the voltage of the power source being tested, no matter how it fluctuates, the current will consistently remain at the set level. The heart of the circuit is a dual operational amplifier chip, the LM358. Each channel controls its own power transistor. A separate power source with a voltage from 12 to 20 volts is needed for the control circuit. Maximum, 24 volts. You can download the printed circuit board along with the project's complete archive via the link in the description. This voltage is needed to power the operational amplifier itself and the reference voltage source in the form of the adjustable Zener diode TL431. The microchip is used as a simple Zener diode, only, highly accurate. In the emitter circuit of the load transistor, there is a low resistance resistor acting as a current sensor. During the operation of the load, quite large currents will flow through this resistor, which will lead to a voltage drop across it. This voltage is fed to one of the inputs of the operational amplifier. The reference voltage, which we can manually adjust by turning the variable resistor, is fed to the other input. The operational amplifier will attempt to equalize the voltage at the inputs by changing its output voltage. The change in output voltage causes the driver transistor to activate. By opening, more or less, it supplies voltage to the base of the power transistor, causing it to also begin opening or closing depending on the position of the variable resistor. As it opens, the resistance of its transition decreases, consequently, the current in the circuit increases, and vice versa. The principle is very simple. The exact same thing happens with the second transistor. The transistors, you could say, are connected in parallel, 
but are controlled by different channels of the operational amplifier. According to this principle, you can connect as many transistors as you want. I have already shown an example of a 600W load circuit, but this is far from the limit. As you can see in the circuit, I use composite transistors, which are easy to control. But you can also use regular ones. This is exactly why there is a driver in the circuit, which is intended to offload the microchip. The driver takes over all the control, and in fact, together with the power transistor, forms an analog of a composite transistor. You can use almost any reverse conducting bipolar transistors, but there is one nuance. The lower the current gain of the power transistor, the more the driver transistor will be loaded, and naturally, it will heat up. Therefore, choose transistors with a gain of more than 100. The higher, the better. Regarding my transistors, they are very robust. So robust that even a transistor tester doesn't recognize them. Such powerful transistors typically have very low gain. According to the specifications, from 8 to 100, but most likely closer to 8, considering that we know well how Soviet transistors were made and their variability. In general, the transistors and drivers manage, but with difficulty. I think it would be worth replacing them with more powerful ones. About the construction, the transistors came to me with their original heatsinks. Just as monstrous as the transistors themselves. The collectors of the transistors are common, so there's no need to isolate them from the heatsink. However, applying thermal paste is necessary. Yes, of course, all of this needs to be cooled, as much as possible. All the power is dissipated on the transistors in the form of heat. So it's a full-fledged heater. The specified resistor is responsible for the upper limit of the output current. The lower its resistance, the higher the current. With these specific component values, the maximum current that can be set on the load will be around 15A. And it shouldn't be increased, as for the specified transistors, this is close to the limit. The higher the load current, the more the current sensors will heat up. Their resistance should preferably remain within the ohm range. But, the higher the power, the better. I recommend using resistors rated at 15 to 20W. In my case, a current sensor in the form of two parallel connected resistors is connected to the emitter circuit of each transistor. Per ohm 5V.T. It's. And that's very little. The resistors become red hot at currents of 20A. More powerful ones are needed. Assembled, connected, it's time to test. The power supply of about 12W for the control circuit in my case is provided by a nickel cadmium battery. We will load a very powerful laboratory power supply. It has a voltage and current indicator, and we'll use them to determine and understand the power dissipated by the load. Voltage on the laboratory power supply. We'll set it to about 20 volts. Let's begin. Let's not be stingy and by rotating the variable resistor of the load. We'll set the current to 20 amperes. I left the load on, note, without a fan, for a minute. Right now, our load is dissipating a colossal power of 400 watts for two transistors. I attached a thermometer to the transistor. As we can see, at this power, the temperature of the switches themselves is low. Therefore, this is not the limit for them. Far from the limit. The heatsink heats up more and faster, which once again confirms that the transistor case manages to transfer heat very quickly and efficiently to the heatsink. And the thermal paste does its job. Next, I replace the specified resistor with a 1 comb 1 to increase the load current. I drew up to 35A. Not bad at all. These transistors are capable of more. But the current sensors in the form of low ohm resistors are operating beyond their capabilities. I won't measure the temperature on them. It's much more than 100 degrees. And in the end, I decided to go all in. I set the lab power supply to 20 volts and loaded the circuit with a current of 30 amps. And that's already 600 watts of power, or 300 watts on each transistor, in the form of pure heat. Minus the power dissipated on the resistors. I'll repeat just in case regarding the choice of transistors. If they are in a 2-247 package, you can get 70 watts from each transistor. Two transistors can handle 140 to 150 watts. If the transistors used are in a 2-220 package, each transistor can handle 40 watts. The maximum load current is equal to the sum of the collector currents of the switches used. 
For example, for type 142 switches, this is 10A. Therefore, the maximum current should not exceed 20A, and it's better to keep it at 15A for a small margin. The same can be said about the voltage. With this setup, I wouldn't recommend applying more than 40V to the load. And most importantly, regardless of the current or voltage, you need to understand that this load can dissipate a maximum of 150 watts. It's better to install a wattmeter at the input to avoid accidentally exceeding the allowable power. What can I say about my transistors? I haven't seen anything more powerful yet. This Soviet beast can easily dissipate 300 watts. Isn't it a monster? I did find out the ultimate capabilities of these transistors. The manufacturer claims a power of 350 watts. I managed to draw 500 watts from a single transistor. Unfortunately, the camera wasn't nearby, and by the time I brought it, the transistor had already kicked the bucket. It worked for about 30 seconds and dissipated 500 watts of heat. Any other transistor would have burned out instantly at that power. I know what you wanted to write. Since the transistor burned out, cut off the lid and show what's inside. Said. And done. The transistor consists of two parts. The emitter terminal, with two multi-strand wires, is welded to a massive metal plate. That, in turn, is soldered to the crystal at four points. The base is in the center. The crystal itself is soldered onto a copper substrate. The crystal is a circle with a diameter of 17 millimeters and a thickness of mm. I won't break it, as we won't be able to see anything. In fact, most of the circle is a plate, most likely made of tungsten. Hence the heavy weight. And the silicon crystal itself is in the form of a thin layer under the sealant. All of this is very similar to a stud-mounted thyristor. And before saying goodbye, I'll remind you that all the necessary links, including the link to download the archive with the printed circuit board, can be found in the description. Don't forget to subscribe to my Instagram, where I upload photos of new projects. That's all from me. As always, this was Kazuya Naka with you. And until we meet again, bye.